Nathan Owen Rosenberg, who is one of the founding partners of Insignium. Um, Nathan, uh, I heard your presentation uh, this morning. Um, wondering if you could give us uh, and our executive members um, uh, some of your thoughts on how to catalyze explosive growth within their organizations. Great. Um, you know, it, most companies are really uh, not taking advantage of people's full contribution, and uh, people have a real difference to make. I mean, you know, let's face it, you and I spend more of our waking time at work than any other place. Uh, and, uh, and if executives can create an environment in which people, A, are clear about the future that the organization's creating, that the, where are we going, what are we making happen in this company, number one, and then two, have an environment in which they can realize that future for the organization, you start to get the beginnings of explosive growth. Uh, but then what it takes is an environment that supports people's creativity. Uh, most of us have had our creativity beaten out of us during our education. Uh, we learned to color within the lines, uh, found out we're not good drawers, we're not good painters, we're not good musicians uh, for most of us. And so uh, we need to recover that creativity that's innate to human beings. Uh, secondly is the structures of the company need to be set up to support innovation and creative thinking take the ideas, have a pathway to turn them into products. Uh, third is that um, value isn't recognized, uh, what we call corporate myopia, that needs to be taken care of. And, and then finally, those ideas need to be turned into products, need to be turned into services, need to be turned into new ways of managing and leading, and so you need, uh, you need pathways for effective execution. And when you put that together, Joe, then you got a chance of of really great growth. Okay. Uh, Nathan, uh, I've heard you challenge companies to uh, look and, and look inside and look deeper, look with a new lens on their own organization uh, to the, the seeds of innovation uh, that might be there. Uh, you're really challenging organizations to take a real uh, new, fresh look. Um, could you describe sort of that process or, sure, or the absolutely. potential results? Yeah. You know, Joe, you and I can both look at the same thing and see two different things. Um, uh, there's a famous international bank that has a whole ad campaign on that, right? Um, and what you see as an opportunity, I can feel as a threat. So one is, is that you need new perspectives. You need new ways of looking. We think that outside eyes can really help a company do that. So whether it's, it's hiring, frankly, to be self-promoting Insignium as, as an outside consulting firm, doing field trips, uh, going to conferences like the one that we're at for these two days. You need ways to bring new perspectives into the organization. That's one. Secondly is to recognize that as human beings, our own perspective is always limited. That's just the nature of being human. You have a point of view, I have a point of view. Now, to what degree can I either say to you, hey Joe, come on over here and try my view, or even better, hey Joe, let me come over there and try your view. And I, and I think um, I rarely see that behavior in executives. Mostly what I see is let me argue from my point of view, you argue for your point of view, and we butt heads. Um, so I think there, there, there's a little bit of uh, maybe some training needed in that area so that people recognize that there's actually a value. You know, I, I think diversity is one of those areas that really started out as a new code word for racial equality. But more and more people are realizing that what diversity is about is a diversity of views, a diversity of ways of looking at things. And so if you can bring those new perspectives, I think you see things that you didn't see before. Yeah, it sounds, Nathan, like that has a significant impact on you know, the classical hierarchical org structure, reporting structures. Um, you know, um, how can you balance that with, you know, sort of a desire to avoid chaos in the organization? Or is that, yeah. or is that kind of chaos, um, uh, uh, does it bring a new freedom in, within the organization? Well, it's really a good question. You know, um, the author Daniel Pink says that one of the things that really drive people's performance is some sense of autonomy. Now, I think a notion of industrial democracy is kind of nutty. Uh, it, as far as I can tell, it doesn't work. So. Uh, I think that one of the things is to put decision making at the appropriate level in the company. So what color the product's going to be is not the CEO's decision. 
that's that's somebody probably in marketing or R and D who has some real familiarity with the customer and the customer's preferences. Uh, where we're going for the future, that probably is the CEO's decision, and probably not the guy or gal in R and D or marketing. So I think there's appropriate levels, Joe. And one of the things that doesn't happen is the sorting out of who should be making those decisions. Um, we have a we have a colleague, a friend, who's a professor at, at the top business school in the United States, and he says that one of the biggest problems in American business and probably global business is this issue of decision rights. And so um, that's one thing. The other thing that you brought up is is guardrails, is to make clear to people we're not going to go outside of this business and we're not going to go outside of this business. I attended at um, one of the studios that's owned, owned by a, a bigger parent company, had no digital uh, uh, policy 10 years ago. And we did a digital conference um, in Europe, brought leaders from every part of the company. And, uh, and one of the things that, that the CEO of the company made real clear is we're not going to get in the gambling business. They had a great opportunity for innovation in gambling, and he said, we're just not going to get into that business. That's, that's what a senior executive should be doing, is we're not going to do that. Everything else inside of it, let's innovate. Okay. Does that make sense? It absolutely Yeah, does. great question. Um, thanks. Uh, last question would be, uh, you mentioned that the potential of an organization hinges on the quality of the conversations yes. that are happening within the organization and on the outside. Right. Can you elaborate a bit on that? Yeah. Well, um, you know, we had this pretty powerful discovery 20-some 20, 20 years ago, which is how you and I get our work done is what we're doing right now. We have conversations. And if you, if you look at uh, people and organizations, a large piece of the work is the conversations. In fact, if you think about it, nothing significant of any, of any size, at least, gets done in an organization without some people having conversations. Almost nobody attends to the quality of those conversations. Almost nobody attends to the discipline of those conversations. So our point is if you and I can adopt some protocols, get some standardized practices around conversations, our productivity will go up. Also, there's particular kinds of conversations that are powerful tools. So for example, in our work, one of the conversations we talk about is rackets. You and I complain about things to each other, but we have no commitment to resolving it. In fact, we get a certain pleasure out of complaining about it. If we brought a tool to resolve those complaints, something good would happen in the company. So that, that would be an example of using a conversation as a tool. It's also the medium in which you and I work. We're surrounded by conversations. We're listening to conversations. So just like air pollution would affect an athlete's performance, polluted conversations impact your and my performance. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's both the medium in which we work, it's the work we do, and it's a tool in getting the work done. Okay. And, uh, and therefore, we happen to think conversations are pretty powerful. And just one last observation. Uh, I suspect that those conversations have bearing on both organizational performance and also one's own career. Uh, no question. No question. So one of the things that, that I always, when I do executive coaching, one of the other things I always ask executives to take an inventory of is, who are you having conversations with? What's the content of the conversations? And what's the structure of the conversations? And if you start to do an inventory of that, Joe, you start to see, wow, A, I keep having the same conversations over and over again, B, with the same people, okay. and they happen within a particular structure, and if I can start having conversations with new people, if I can have new conversations with some of the same people, and if I can alter the structure of the conversations, my performance is going to change, and my opportunities for the future are going to change. Pretty simple. Not easy to do, but pretty straightforward.